in the Bible, there was a story that happened to prophet Elisha in 2 Kings chapter 2 verse 19 and it says this, Then the man of the city said to Elisha, Please notice the situation of this city is pleasant as the Lord sees, but the water is bad and the ground barren. So Elisha said, Bring to me a new bowl and put salt, somebody say salt, put salt in it and they brought it to him and he went out to the source, somebody say source. He went out to the source of the water, cast in the salt, somebody say salt, salt in there and says, thus says the Lord, I have healed this water, from it there shall be no more death nor barrenness. So the water remains healed to this day according to the word that Elisha spoke. I want you to notice what happened is that there was the city that they were in, the city was pleasant but the water was poisonous and because the water was poisonous the land couldn't produce anything agriculturally. The prophet of God he says I want you to take some salt, somebody say salt. salt. The Bible says you are salt of the earth. Somebody say salt. salt. The Bible says you are the salt of the earth. I didn't hear that. Somebody say salt. salt. The Bible says you are the salt of the earth. Okay, the prophet says let's take some salt and the Bible says this and you said source, somebody say source. So he goes to where the source of this water is, he puts some salt, somebody say salt. He puts salt at the source, somebody say salt at the source. He puts salt at the source and then what happens is this water gets healed and there was no more poison, it was no more toxic, there was no more toxins and the water gets healed. What I want to let you know right now, listen to me very carefully, is that your school is the source of water. The water speaks of the leaders, the water speaks of the students that become mayors, students that become nurses and doctors, students that become entertainers, students that become politicians, students that become mayors and lawyers, students that become teachers, students that become pastors. So your school is the source where the water, the students come out from and they fill the community, they fill the education sphere, they fill the media sphere, they fill the medical sphere, they fill the political sphere and what begins to happen in our culture today, we see a drift away from God but if you track to where it all started, it started at the source. Long time ago in the United States when you were going to school in the morning, the first thing you did is you would call on God's help. Today that got removed and said that's not constitutional. And then what started to happen is this, abortion came in. What started to happen is that all kinds of godless teaching came into schools and our schools are the source. Somebody say the school is the source. The school is the source where all of this stuff begins. But our God has a solution. Somebody say solution. The solution is this. God says, I want to take the salt, meaning my youth, my students, children. I want to take my teens and I want to put them at the source of the problem. Through the unashamed club through the unashamed leaders, through the unashamed meetings. Why? So that we can heal the source and then the water will be pure and the water will be healed. You are strategically positioned in your middle school and in your high school. Not only to get good grades, not only to win scholarships and to win games, but to be the salt. Somebody shout salt. salt. At the source. Meaning your school has to be better because of you. The fighting, the drugs, the immorality, the racism, the backbiting, the bullying, all of that has to come to an end because the salt came at the source which is you. Christ in you, Jesus in you, the Holy Spirit in you. As we're going back to school on Monday, as we're going back to school on Tuesday, I want you to go not just hyped, I want you to go with purpose that you are there to be the salt at the source. 
Those of you who went to universities and it may seem like man but they're pushing so much stuff on us. People don't believe in God. They teach that we came from evolution. We're more than we were like monkeys. They push the critical race theory. They push that idea that you can choose your own gender. They push the idea that you know you probably are trapped in the wrong body. They push all of that. All of that is coming at the source and you may feel small. You may feel insignificant but last time I checked when my mom puts salt in soup she doesn't dump a truckload. We don't need to be many of us to make the most impact in our schools. All we gotta be is real ones. We may be few but real ones. We might be small but we are genuine. We might not be huge number but we are genuinely in love with Jesus and we have the Holy Spirit with us and so that's salt. Somebody shout salt, salt. At, the at the source. In my school, school. will bring salvation to this generation. Come on if you believe that make some noise for Jesus. We're gonna change our schools for God. We're gonna change our generation for Jesus. We are not here to settle. We are not here to get used to the dark. We are here to be the salt at this water. And we might not be big but we are potent and the devil knows that. We are strong and demon. That's why the devil wanted to take us out. That's why the enemy wants to silence you. That's why he has so many distractions against you. Why? Because once he knows you unleash the saltiness, the world is going to become better tasting because of you. Your surrounding is going to be better tasting. Your classroom will be better tasting because of you. Your family will experience you differently. Your world will experience you differently. Can somebody make some noise for Jesus? How? Do you become salt as a teenager? How do you become salt as a teenager? I want you to open your Bible with me to Psalm 90 and verse 10. Psalm 90 and verse 10 and it says the following. At first it might not make sense this verse but I'm gonna break it down to you in just a moment. The days of our lives are 70 years. Somebody say 70. And if by the reason of strength, meaning if you eat your broccoli, listen to your parents, do some running and it flows in your genetics, you, the Bible says, by the reason of its strength, they are 80 years, yet their boast is only labor and sorrow. Watch this. The Bible says in Psalm, we just read, the days of our life by God, the standard age that every person's probably gonna have, unfortunately, is 70. Somebody say 70. Now let's do a little bit of math. How many years you are as a teenager? Teenager is when you have a teen attached to your number of age. 13, 14, 15, 18. What is that? How many is that? How many years the Bible says we're gonna live? How many years are you a teenager? Let's practice that again. How many years the Bible says we're gonna live? Seven. How many years you're a teenager? Seven. What is seven out of 70? It's 10. It's about 10% of your life. So you're a teenager about 10% of your life. Let me ask you a question. What is this thing that Christians do when they give 10%? What is it called? Tithing. What if I were to tell you that the reason why many of you cannot give your tithe is because you are a tithe. That's a word. If you're taking notes or posting an Instagram story, I want you to listen to me very carefully. Teenage years are your tithe to the Lord. That's why most of us don't have any offerings in youth because the money that you give at youth is, is your parents' money anyway. And that's okay. That's okay. The, the, the goal is not to get money. The goal is to give not a tithe of money, to give a tithe of your teenage years because your teenage years are about seven years 
of all of your life as the Bible says in Psalm 90 which tells me that your teenage years are your tithe to God. If you give your tithe to God as a teenager, your years, these seven years from 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, these seven years you give them entirely to God, guess what begins to happen? You become a salt that did not lose its flavor. Because you can be a salt that's not salty. You can be a Christian that talks Christian but doesn't live Christian. Come on, we know those Christians in schools. They only talk to talk, they don't walk to walk. They look like salt but they taste like sugar. We call them fake Christians. Uh-huh. They, they worship on Sunday but they complain and they gossip on Monday look like salt but they they taste like something else see God doesn't want you to be a salt that lost its power God doesn't want you to be powder he wants you to be salt that you have saltiness about you you don't have to be big but you can still be potent you can still be strong you can still be influential but there is a one little secret that you have to have and this is one secret you have to give God a tithe what is that tithe? That tithe is your teenage years. From the age of 13 till 19, all of those years they have to be given entirely. Not to romance, but to reverence of God. Not to chasing popularity but chasing purpose. Not to trying to be cool, trendy and famous, but trying to be faithful and honoring. When you grow older and you're gonna get a job, you start making money, or for those of you who already make money and you take 10%, what typically we do with the tithe is this, is you bring it to God. You don't buy new sneakers. You don't use that tithe to buy burgers. You don't use that tithe to cash up somebody or you pay for an uber drive. You take the tithe, all of it and you bring it to God. You don't eat it, meaning you don't waste it on your own self, you give it to God. Why do you give tithe? The reason why people give 10% of their income is they want God to bless the rest of their income. The reason why you give your teenage years is so that the rest of your years will be set in motion of honoring God. So I want to share with you four practical things of how you can give your teenage years to God. Number one, write this down, prioritize your spiritual life above everything else. Write this down, prioritize your spiritual life above everything else. In Genesis, and I'm going to take the story of Adam and Eve. In Genesis, Genesis 1.11, if you have your Bible with me, I want you to go there. Genesis 1.11, it says, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit after its kind. So verse 11, God speaks to the earth and says, Earth, produce fruit, produce trees, and the earth produces trees. Let me ask you a question. Who created trees? But we just read that God spoke to the earth to produce trees. So who produced trees then? The earth. So this is the ground. God speaks to the ground and says produce trees. And the Bible says that the ground produced trees. Okay. I want you to read verse 20. In verse 20 the Bible says, then God said, let the waters abound with the abundance of living creatures. So we read first, God speaks to the soil and says, I want you to make trees. The soil says, yes sir. And then we see later on, God speaks to the water and says, water, you produce fish. And the water says, yes sir, produces fish. So who created fish? The water. Because God spoke to the water to produce fish. 
But I want you to notice in the same chapter, God speaks verse 26 to himself. It says this, let us make man in our image and likeness. And guess what comes out of God? You and I. Track with me. This will change your world. God spoke to the ground and the trees came out of the ground. Let me ask you a question. Does the soil need the tree to be soil? But does the tree need the soil to live? Yeah. Does the ocean need fish to be an ocean? Does the fish need an ocean to be a fish? Yes. Does God need you to be God? No. Do you need God to be you? Yes. If you ever meet a philosopher, a person who has more degrees than a Fahrenheit, who will convince you, you don't need God. It's almost like God in the first chapter of his book broke that down for us so simple and he says I made trees out of the ground I made fish out of the water and I made you out of me why so anytime you get a little bit confused and forgetful all you got to do is look at the fish and realize man they need water look at the trees they need soil and you look at yourself and you say I need God why I came from God the way fish came from the water and trees came from soil God is still God without you. You without God are nothing. Soil is still soil without the trees. Kill all the trees, the soil will still be there. But the trees without soil, they die. Fish, if it disappears from the ocean, the ocean is still ocean. But if you take the fish out of the ocean, the fish begins to die. Maybe you're here today and you were invited and you're enjoying, you're having the good time, you're having fun. But the idea that, that God is real, that God exists is kind of very far from you. And maybe this is just an emotional experience. What I want to do right now is this. I want to ground you not just in the experience, but in the biblical truth that not only God exists, but God created you in His image and likeness. And He demonstrated to us by not making us first, but by making trees first from the soil because the trees need the soil to live, to be green, to produce. And then God went and He made the fish from the water and the fish need water to live and to produce. And then it's almost like God was setting us up to give us an example of how much we need God. And then God makes you not out of a big bang that exploded million, million, million years ago in billion, billion, billion galaxies away. But God speaks to Himself and says, let us. Now God is the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. I find that interesting. You are a spirit, soul and body. You came from God. You reflect the trineness of God when you were made in His image. That's why there is a longing inside of you for something that's invisible, for something that's beyond this world. Why is that? You came from God, therefore you need God. So when you want to be a salt to your generation, you have to prioritize your source. And your source is God. Like a fish, you got to be in the ocean. Like a tree, you got to be planted in the soil. This is not being super spiritual. This is being human. Your friends will tell you you're weird. Is fish weird when it's in the ocean? Is, is the tree weird when it's planted? What is weird? Is it weird to be connected to a God that you were made in His image and likeness or it's weird not to be connected to Him? The devil is a liar. It's time to make serving Jesus great again. It's time to make loving Jesus famous again. It's time not to be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's time not to be ashamed that you love Jesus. You love the Bible. Why? Because you came from God. You need God. Yes. Come on, give high five to your neighbor and say, you need God. Turn to your other neighbor and simply say, like fish needs water. Turn to your first neighbor and say, like trees need soil. 
so what is the first point that I mentioned is that we need to prioritize our spiritual life above everything else. The Bible says that God makes Adam out of himself. Adam and Eve out of himself. He created us in his image and likeness. You need God the way fish needs water, the way trees need soil. That's why most important thing every day is your faith. It's not your friends. Most important thing every day is your faith. It's not your feelings. Most important thing every day is your connection to God. And if you say, well, no, but I don't want to do that. You're like a fish that's leaving the ocean. You're like a tree that's pulling away from the soil. What are the consequences? You start dying. You start slowly dying. You don't die on the outside. You die on the inside. And after that spiritual death comes other death where you lose your purpose. Why do kids want to physically die? Because they die spiritually. Death leads to more death. You start making decisions that bring death. People start cutting themselves. They start self-inflicting harm on their young life, young body. You will say, how would anybody, why would anybody do that? But see, when this, when this inside is dead, what's the point of living for anything else? But the way you stay alive is not by taking drugs. The way you stay alive is not by experiencing sex. The way you stay alive is not by experiencing weed. The way you stay alive is the same way fish stays alive. Is you got to find your ocean. You got to find your soil. So the way you become a soul to your school, the way you shake your school for Christ, is number one, you prioritize your source, you prioritize where you came from, your spiritual life. Number two, and we're looking at Adam, we're first going to read, read the verse and in Adam we see this, the Bible says Genesis chapter 2 verse 15, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and to keep it. Number two, take care of your spiritual life by reading the Bible and ministering to others. Write this down. Take care of your spiritual life by reading the Bible and ministering to others. The first thing that I mentioned is take care of your spiritual life. Make your spiritual life the number one priority. The way fish needs water, trees need soil is the way we need God. God doesn't need us but He wants us and without Him we are not going to make it. The second thing is prioritize your spiritual life by reading the Bible and ministering to others. Hold that thought for just a second. If you go to school long enough, sooner or later you're going to come across a teaching from your school that you most likely came from a monkey. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You didn't come from a monkey. I don't have a biology degree, but I have a Bible degree. My Bible degree comes from the verse that I just read to you, that you were made in the image and likeness of God. Why it's dangerous to believe that you came from a monkey? If you believe you came from a monkey, it's a matter of few years and you behave like a monkey. Animals, animals don't have a spirit. Therefore, they're controlled by their sexuality. When you teach a human being, you don't have a spirit. You didn't come from God. You're simply an animal. Guess what begins to happen? Your feelings begin to dictate your decisions. And one day you get up and you say, you know what? I'm a girl. I like girls. Oh, I must be a lesbian. What is happening? You're acting like an animal. Why? Because an animal allows its urges to dictate its decisions. But the Bible tells us that we as Christians, we as humans, we have to control our feelings. That means if one day I get up and I want to punch somebody, I don't say, oh yeah, let me just go punch them. I control that and I say, no, I'm not going to do that. Why? Because I am not my feelings. I am not my sexuality. I'm a spiritual being that has a sexuality. I am not a sexual being that happens to be spiritual. So I want to let you know, reject 
the garbage that school sells you that says you are just a glorified a chimpanzee. You're just a glorified monkey. You are not that. You are creation of God. You are beautiful and wonderfully made. You are intelligent. You are beautiful. You are strong. You are powerful. You're not an involving ape. You are made in the image and likeness of God. You are not your feelings. You are not your urges. You are not your gender. You are creation of God. You made your spirit and spirit doesn't have gender. You don't have to yield to those lies of the enemy. Come on somebody. You don't have to yield to those cravings. Number two is we have to take care of our spiritual life by reading the Word and by ministering to others. I want you to notice this about in the Bible. It says this. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 15. Timothy was a young man, probably younger than me. He was a pastor of a large church in Ephesus. And this is what Paul writes to him. And that from childhood you have known the veggie tales. No, that's not what it says. And from childhood you have known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvations. Look at this, look at Timothy. People look at him you're like, man, how did you become a pastor, Timothy? You're a young man. And Paul says, since you were a child, your parents didn't put Netflix in front of you to numb you and to keep you shut up. The Bible says, Timothy, from childhood, knew the scriptures. How do you take care of your spiritual life? You begin to read the Bible every single day. Read the translation you understand. If it's difficult to read, let it read to you. Listen to the Bible every single day. But I want you to notice not only Timothy, Miriam was a young girl, most likely a teenager. She sees her brother being put in a little ark and Miriam saves her brother Moses. And Moses had an older sister named Mary, most likely just a young teenager or a preteen. And the moment she sees little Mo, her brother being picked up, she comes quickly to the Pharaoh's daughter and says, listen, I can help you find a nurse. Of course, not telling her that that's her younger brother. And she really helps to rescue Moses being a preteen. There was another girl that was captured by a guy named Naaman. And she was a slave, forgotten by her family, true victim. And she tells Naaman, she says, I want to tell you something. There is a guy, a prophet. I see you have a leprosy, like you have a skin problem. I can tell you about a guy who, he doesn't charge, but he heals people. If you go there, he will heal you. The crazy part is Naaman was going to get prayed by the guy that he just conquered. Because a teenage girl told him about miracles, which tells me she was watching videos of miracles. Which tells me she heard stories about miracles. Which tells me that as a young woman, she was exposed to the supernatural. She didn't just read about the God of the Old Testament. She saw somehow, maybe her mama took her to the Elisha's meetings. That's why it's important that you expose yourself. Not to the voodoo, not to the sorcery, not to the Ouija boards, not to the haunted houses, not to hearing demonic voices, but to signs and wonders. Casting out of demons, speaking in tongues, you expose yourself to the supernatural of God. So you tell your friends who maybe have an incurable disease, God can help you. You can tell your friends if they hear voices of ghosts in the house, you say, listen, that paranormal activity, there is a solution for that. It is the name of Jesus Christ. You don't need a potion. You don't need to make any sacrifices to some other God. Listen, you don't need to practice white magic or black magic. You need Jesus. You need the Holy Spirit. This girl, she helps a guy. Samuel. The Bible says Samuel was just a boy. Most likely 12 years of age, maybe 11. And the Bible says this, he was ministering to the Lord. You could see Sammy walking around the temple. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. And a teenager takes care of his spiritual life by reading the scriptures. And God comes one night and says, Samuel, Samuel, Samuel. He thought it was his, the guy, the priest calling him. He came to his room and he says, hey, did, did you call me? Did you, do you want something? You want some water or something? He's, Eli says, no, I, I didn't call you. Samuel goes back to sleep. 
Samuel, Samuel, audible voice comes into his room and he's just a teenager. He goes to Eli again. He says, Eli, did you just call me again? And Eli says, no, I didn't call you. And Eli got the point. He said, oh my goodness, God is talking to the teenage boy. Almighty God is speaking not to the priest, not to the big shot, to a young boy. And the third time, Eli told him, he says, when he calls like that, tell him this, Lord, your servant listens, speak to me. And God came third time, guess to who? Not somebody who finished a Bible degree. He probably didn't graduate middle school, but he's taking care of his spiritual life by reading the scriptures, by ministering to God. And God says, Samuel, Samuel. And God gives him a word about a guy that he's serving under and Samuel releases that. Do not underestimate the importance of developing your spiritual life, keeping care of your spiritual garden just because you're 13. Remember, your teenage years are what? Your teenage years are what? It's your tithe to God. Do you remember our Lord Jesus Christ at 12 years of age? The Bible says he's sitting with the teachers of the law like this and he's listening to them at 12 years of age and he's preaching in the temple. He's not running around just playing games. Nothing wrong with that. Jesus is preaching at 12. Most of you look at Jesus, you're like, yeah, at 30, he started casting out demons. Jesus started it at 12. So don't ever let the enemy lie to you and say, you can't be preaching. You can't tell your friends about Christ. You can't see the supernatural. You can't speak in tongues. You got to wait until you like get a license. You got to wait until you go to college. The devil is a liar. If kids get exposed to weed at the age of 12, if they watch porn at the age of 11, if they get abused, listen, if the, the enemy does that to this generation, can you imagine how much more God wants to take you at this age and expose you to his world. Get you speaking in tongues. Get you laying your hands on the sick. Get you open your mouth and tell other kids about Jesus and not only get a degree in school but get some disciples. Shake some things up. The Bible says in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. That doesn't mean gossip, yell and drop blankety blankety. It just means you will give prophetic words. God wants to use you. Can somebody say amen? amen. I want to challenge you today under no circumstance. And I love what I saw today during worship. The moment the presence of God comes in and a lot of you guys, you automatically turn and you start praying for other people. It's almost like it's natural. And I want to let you know your greatest moments with Jesus they're not waiting to be happen when you grow up. They're happening now and they're the only way you're growing up spiritually. It's happening at your school, when you step out, when Braden prayed for his friend on Thursday night. It's happening now when you invite a friend and who doesn't know Jesus and, and for the first time they come and, and, they're, and they're saying, I have pain and you say, can I pray for you? And with that kind of a simple faith, but you believe Jesus heals and you lay your hands on them and next thing you know, they get healed. You're like, this is incredible. God can use me. Yes, He can. Because when you take care of your spiritual life, guess what begins to happen? You begin to minister as a young person and you're becoming a salt. That's how you become a salt, by making your teenage years your tithe to God. How do you give the tithe? Because you prioritize your spiritual life. And number two is you take care of your spiritual life because you can prioritize it and never take care of it. Meaning you never feed your spiritual life. You never read the Word. You never step out and minister to somebody. You never step out and give a prophetic word. You don't open yourself before you go to sleep and write a journal. I remember I was interviewing Jeremiah Johnson. He sees about eight dreams a night from God. It started at seven years of age. At seven years of age, God came to him in a dream. He woke up, he didn't know what to do. He ran to his dad and his dad told him, he says, I want you to sleep with the tape recorder. So when God speaks to you in a dream, I want you to wake up, quickly record it and go back to sleep. Every single night, he gets about four times when God speaks to him in the dream. He wakes up because it's so vivid and so real. And he would quickly tape, take it to a seven-year-old, eight-year-old recorded and then come 
to the breakfast table and say, Dad, which one do you want me to tell you? The first one, the second, the third or the fourth? Tells his dad, he says, Dad, in the dream, God showed me a woman that she's going to be wearing this collar. She will come to church today. She will have this problem and God wants you to pray for her. When you pray for her, she will be healed. In the second dream, I saw God's going to help us to build this church and we're going to, once this happens, this is what's going to happen. In the, in the third one, and pretty much a kid just becomes like a messenger for Almighty God at eight years of age. Why not can it be you? Why not you? Why not me? It can. What I'm asking you right now is this, is you open yourself up. And you say, Holy Spirit, use me. But how does that happen? Prioritize your spiritual life. Read the scriptures every single day. And before you go to sleep, instead of scrolling through TikTok, take a moment of silence before Jesus and tell the Lord this. Say, Lord, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Your servant is listening. And you'll be surprised how you wake up. You say, man, I think I met Jesus in the dream. Oh my goodness, I saw angels. I heard God speak and then keep a journal and begin to write those things down and you will begin to see a shift in your spiritual life and then you become a salt. Why? Because your teenage years are what? Your teenage years are what? And the first thing we need to do is prioritize our spiritual life. And the second thing we need to do is we need to take care of our spiritual life by reading the scriptures and ministering. The third thing that we need to do, are you still with me? The third thing we need to do is this, beware of attractions that become distractions. <sighs> Attractions, they become distractions. Genesis 2.21, it says this about Abraham, excuse me, uh, uh, Adam, Adam. And the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in his place. Song of Solomon 2 7 it says this, I charge you O daughters of Jerusalem by the gazelles or by the doers of the field. Do not stir up love, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. So give you a little uh, story about Adam. Adam is with God. He came from God. He needs God. He depends on God. He walks with God. Adam doesn't have a Bible but he knows God's voice. Adam doesn't have a church but he knows God's presence. Adam is so lost in God, there's not another human being within million and million and million of miles away, only just animals. Adam is so lost in God, Adam does not know he's alone. Think about this. God comes to Adam and says, you need somebody in your life. And Adam says, what does that look like? Adam doesn't come to God and say, Lord, I'm so lonely. There's nobody to talk to. I'm so lonely. I'm so lonely. He doesn't tell that to God because Adam doesn't even know he's lonely. Because when you have, when God is all you have, a lot of times God is all you need. Adam doesn't look for a girlfriend. Adam doesn't look for a wife even. And there's not another human being. If you really want to fix loneliness, loneliness doesn't get fixed when you get a little chica and loneliness doesn't get fixed when you get a boyfriend. But loneliness only gets fixed when you get to know the presence of God and you get so lost in God, the other person has to find God to find you. Adam is so lost in God. Adam is just literally walking around butt naked enjoying God and God comes to Adam and says, Adam, um, I want to talk to you about something. Uh, Adam, can I talk to you about something? Uh, yeah, yes, Lord, you can talk to me about anything. Uh, I've been enjoying our walks together. They, they've been amazing. I've been enjoying talking with you, Adam, but you need somebody else in your life. God, I don't need anybody. I have you. Yes, I, I know you have me, but you also need somebody else. I want you to notice that when you get so lost in God, that you don't need other things when it's not the right time. So God sends Adam on a mission to find another human being, a wife, somebody that will be kind of doing life with him. There was only one problem. There was nothing available. So God sends Adam on a mission to name animals. Adam, he names the animals and pretty much the Bible says that it was not found for Adam indicates while Adam is naming animals, he is looking kind of like, Elephant, no. Python, no. Oh. Black mamba, no. Or black spiders, no, not spiders. And then there was a monkey. <laughs> kind of like him. A little too much hair. Weird tail, kind of does the weird thing with the tail. And I love the fact that Adam didn't choose a monkey to bring to God and say, Lord, 
could you fix this a little bit? Like it just needs a few surgeries, few modifications and she'd be all right. And she's all right. We can learn to get along. Before God brings you an Eve, devil will present you a monkey. What is a monkey? What is a monkey? A monkey is somebody you're dating, hoping for God to convert. What is a monkey? It's someone you're dating and secretly praying for God to convert them. But the reason why you're dating them is because they're hot. So is hell. And you go to a youth group and you're like, but you know, in youth group, we don't have those fine boys. But that boy is fine. He's hot. Honey, so is hell. And you do not want to date hell. But Pastor Vlad, you don't understand. I'm going to flirt so I can convert. I'm going to, I'm going to get him saved. Through my love for them, you, you see, I'm going to get him saved. I know he believes in Allah. I know he is Buddhist. I understand he uses sage and connects and meditates and aligns his chakras. But you know, you know, you don't understand. I'm working on him. And you're like, karabarashi, karabarabarashi, ka Holy Spirit, change him. Holy Ghost, change him. Holy Ghost, change him. And that's when you know you already chose somebody that God hasn't prepared for you because you're secretly praying for God to change them. Adam did not bring bring an animal to God for God to work on and do a surgery. He came back to God and said, God, I'm sorry, I couldn't find anybody for you to work on. Don't date people that you're praying for God to change. I know he's addicted to drugs, but he's doing better than he was before. I remember when I was a youth pastor, we had a girl in our youth group and she just became a leader and we had this policy at the time where if you're in high school, we discouraged dating. We still have that? We still have that? Oh, really? We have that? <laughs> okay. I, I knew that, but I just wanted to see if you guys kind of... So I remember this young lady, she wanted to become a leader and, uh, and she said, Pastor, I just want to let you know that I found the perfect guy and we're going to have to break the rule because the guy I found is worthy to break this rule. And I said, okay, all right, uh, tell me about the guy. She's like, he's from a different city. And I was like, okay, red flag number one. <laughs> I've, never, I've never met him, red flag number two. And, but I can show you his MySpace, which red flag number three. I go on this MySpace and I thought I went on the porn site. Literally, this guy's MySpace, MySpace was like a Facebook today, all over, is just literally soft porn. Girls would just like expose stuff. And I was like, is this his profile? She's like, oh, he's doing so much better. I said, you telling me he was worse? I'm like, what was he, pedophile or something? I was like, I was like, girl, are you, are you crazy? What are you doing? She's like, but his heart is in the right place. I'm like, I hope it is over there. His heart, is that the only thing that's in the right place? And I was like, girl, you gotta leave him. She's like, you don't understand. We're in love. He, he, he loves me. He treats me like you guys are all not understand. You're just a bunch of hypocrites. So anyway, she decides to leave the church. She goes to meet him. He takes her virginity, drops her. The next day, breaks up with her and everywhere online posts explicit photos and texts of her and calls her the S word. Poor girl ruined, got ruined by this weirdo because she fell for something that was evil. How do you fall for it? It's very simple. When it's not the right time to date, you usually end up liking, there's nothing wrong with liking somebody. That's normal. That's natural. That just shows that you're a human being. What you do with your feelings, that's different. You can feed them or you can redirect them. The reason why you cannot feed your feelings is because your teenage years are what? That means you can't give it to your boyfriend. 
You can have those feelings, don't get me wrong. You just cannot feed on them. Why? Because you have, you, you gave your teenage years as a... That means you can't take it from God's altar and say, hey, let me give it to your boyfriend. Did you know that one statistic says the people that you like in high school, your chance of marrying them is one in 5,000. Another statistic I found today is that your chance of marrying your sweetheart from high school is one in 100 to two in 100 and only one out of 100 marriages actually last and the rest of one out of 100 do not last. Which means in five to six years, the person you have a crush on and you can sleep because they're so incredible and amazing and you're stalking them everywhere. In six years, mark my words, you will not remember their name. You will be like, what is that idiot's name? I mean, that, what is that fool's name? Man, the guy that like literally three months made my life miserable. And uh, skipped the youth group because I was chasing him everywhere he was at. I didn't go to the, I didn't become an ashamed club leader. Why? Because I was so infatuated. Hoping he's going to return my DMs or he's going to Snapchat me back and all of this stuff. And so I'm mean, like, what is his name? What, what, was, what was his name? What was his last name? I don't remember. But now you can't remember God because you're so infatuated with him. So my message to you today is that the devil will use an attraction to create a distraction. Why is the devil doing that? He wants to steal your tithe so it doesn't go on the altar so you don't become salt and so you don't stop the poison that is flowing from the source of your school. So what do we do? What do we do with these feelings? Well I just read in Song of Solomon it says this, do not awaken love. So, so Adam comes to God and says, God, I did not find anybody. I mean, God, I did find somebody. I want to talk to her about her. Um, this Linda that I met over there. And uh, no offense to any, anybody named Linda, by the way, and stuff. So, but this person that I met, actually, it's kind of four-legged animal. And, uh, but you know, I decided I'll rather wait for you to bring the right person than to wait for you to change the wrong person I brought to you because I didn't wait for you to bring the right person in the first place. And God says, okay, you ready for the step two? Uh, yes, Lord, I'm ready. And God puts him to sleep. Now what happens when you're sleeping? You're not dead. But it looks like you're dead. Right? You're dead when you sleep? When your dad sleeps, he looks like he's dead. You have to shake him up and wake him up. Uh -huh. But when you sleep, this is what happens. You're breathing. You're alive. Your eyes are typically closed. If your eyes are open when you sleep, it's kind of freaky though. But most of you, when you sleep, your eyes are closed. And this is what happens. The reason why you have to sleep is this. Because the next day you have a full day of activities. Like for example, today we have a conference, a lot of activities, a lot of worship, a lot of running around, a lot of uh, games and all of that, a lot of preaching to hear. If you don't sleep during the night, this is what happens during the day. All the activities that are exciting and fun, you go like this. So why do you yawn during the day? It's because you usually don't sleep during the night. What if I were to tell you your teenage years are your night season where God wants you to sexually sleep. So that when it's your time to be married, you don't have a yawning marriage. You don't have this. You know yawning marriages are marriages where the teenagers spend all their energy dating anything that moved in high school and middle school. And then they get married and they don't date their mate because they were busy dating anything and everything that wasn't their mate. If there will be more dating in our marriages, less of our marriages will be in courts. Less of our marriages will be in divorce. How do you know a dating couple in a restaurant and a couple that's married? A dating couple doesn't eat. <laughs> Touching each other like... The server keeps coming 10 times already. Do you, are you guys going to order anything? Just, just, just 50 more minutes. <laughs> Looking into each other's eyes. And then you look at the married couple. They don't talk. They're on their phone. <laughs> what do you want? Same thing. Okay. Why is that happening? If you track those people, not every case, but if you track those people, you will see one common thing. When they were in high school, they dated. They spend all their energy 
all their ideas on people they never married. God doesn't want your dating to be in high school. He wants your dating to be in marriage. So when you get married, you have dating with your spouse, not with your girlfriend. I'm not saying that there's nothing wrong to, there's something wrong to date. There's nothing wrong to, with date. But dating is for marriage and marriage is for dating. And when you're a teenager, God wants you to close your eyes. Meaning, you don't come to church to look for a boy. You don't scroll through Instagram to look for a boy, but you close your eyes. It's not that you're against dating. It's not that you're against feelings. No, no, no. You have genuine feelings and you might even find, you come to church and you find this new boy like, man, who's that? He's an ashamed club leader. Oh, I'm called to be an ashamed club leader too. I want to be close to that man of God right there. I mean, Lord, let the stars align and, and you have these natural desires, natural feelings. There's nothing wrong with that. What we need to do with those feelings is do what God did to Adam is we go to sleep with them. Those feelings, not with that person though. That means we close our eyes. <laughs> we close our eyes and when we come, we intentionally do not look for that person. Why do we have to sexually sleep? Why our attractions have to go to sleep? We don't kill them we put them to sleep because they're natural. It's part of being a human being is you're drawn to somebody else. Nothing is sinful about that. But when you don't put them to sleep, young people listen to me very carefully. I know that I'm not preaching at you. I am speaking with you. If you do not put your sexual desires to sleep, they will put your spiritual appetite to sleep. Every teenager, and I was 14 years, 14 years in youth ministry, I tracked this one thing. The moment a teenager gave in to those attractions, their spiritual life went to sleep. I'm not saying they spiritually died. They spiritually started to slumber. They missed leadership meetings. They didn't want to worship. And when they came to worship, they didn't raise their hands. They held their hands with somebody else. They were not necessarily pursuing Jesus anymore because they were too busy pursuing them. And this is what typically happened. They usually broke up in six months, created drama and jealousy within the youth group. And the devil used that discord. And now we had a group of girls attacking this guy, group of guys attacking this girl. Gossip, discord, jealousy, and all of this stuff. And it's almost like bad blood came. And all of that started with this thing. Attraction, they became distraction. God wants you to put your sexual desires and your attractions to sleep when you're a teenager. When you graduate out of high school, you get your license and you get your job. When you have your AA and you're about to go get your BA, then that could be maybe a good time to start kind of opening your eyes and considering that. But until that time, God wants you to focus on your spiritual life being awake. God wants you to focus to finish your grades. God wants you to focus on your friends, on your family, on your purpose. God wants you to focus your, your attention on your athletic abilities and your education so that you can sleep during the night when the day comes which will come when you hit that season when you're 20 21 it's gonna be a dawn in your life and honestly it's gonna be a good season in your life and when that season comes so you're not walking yawning but you're fresh you're amazing you know when I look at Pastor Zach and I look at Genesis and Zach, when he was a young man, you know, I knew pretty much almost every crash that Zach had. But what I loved about Zach, he didn't allow his crush to crush him. He brought his crush to Jesus and he said, I know it's not the right time and I'm gonna close my eyes and I'm gonna go to sleep and at the right time, I'm gonna open my eyes and it's gonna be a beautiful thing that God's going to do. The reason why God uses him today, it's not because he's just any special. He prioritized his spiritual life. He started to feed himself spiritually and he like every human being and every teenager had attractions and because he was so good looking and vibrant girls were attracted to him and what he had to do is this close his eyes and say you know I'm gonna focus on the purpose I'm gonna focus on Jesus's calling and even when he became just a youth pastor and the attraction was there and I told Zach and I said put that aside build a youth ministry the right time is gonna come and then the right time came and Zach would tell you, it was scary when the right time came. Like, man, this, I can't believe this is happening. This is so beautiful. This is so amazing. This is so incredible. And 
It's like everybody's blessing me and everybody's encouraging. I don't have to go hide. I don't have to keep this a secret thing. I can celebrate that. The church celebrates that. The family celebrates that. And when it's the right time, it's a beautiful thing. When it's the wrong time, you're sneaky. When it's the wrong time, you're hiding it. When it's the wrong time, it steals your spiritual life. When it's the wrong time, it's actually hell sent missile to distract you. Because the devil saw weed didn't work. The devil saw suicide didn't work. The devil saw pornography did not work. And he says, I'm going to give you something you have a hard time resisting because it actually goes contrary to your own desires. I'm going to mess with the human attraction that actually came from God. And I'm going to see, will you take this bait? Because if you take this bait, I will kill your spiritual life. I will put your spiritual life to silence. I will bring jealousy in the youth group. I will bring division in the youth group. I will break your heart because that guy is not interested in love. He's interested in lust and he will use you and then he will leave you heartbroken. And I will accomplish all of that by presenting you an attraction. That can become a distraction. I remember when at 15 I was not a youth pastor yet and there was a girl that came to our youth group that was the only one who was not my cousin and I was like I found the one that I love. I found my wife. That's it. I, for three days I'm getting visions from God. God is answering my prayer. Finally, I see another girl that's not my cousin. This is incredible. And there was two sisters, one for Ilya, one for me. And I was like, bro, we got it. And we we're like 15. And that's it. And I was like, man, I'm ready for marriage. And I'm thinking already how to tell my parents I'm going to get married in six months. And I remember my pastor saw that at 15. He saw that I was, because my eyes like lit on fire. When I was around her, like I was on fire for God. I was like, I was just like another level. My pastor pulls me up and he said, he said, you like her? And my face turns red. I said, no. And he said, not only you like her, but you're also lying. And I said, and he said, shake it off what I'm like that's from God God sent this person to me what do you mean shake it off he says you're 15 he says you don't marry the first person that you like he says you got 10 years still ahead of you build a youth ministry I said but we don't have any other people in our church that's like the first woman woman first young lady that's not my cousin what if nobody else comes what if another guy comes and steals her from me <laughs> pastor you don't understand God answered my prayer and pastor says snap out of it he says Vlad this infatuation is not real love but I said it feels like real love it like it controls me he says that's the problem he said real love doesn't control you you control real love he says if it gives you sleepless nights that is not love he says that's lust that's infatuation I said don't tell me that's lust that's a love from God And I remember I went one time with this girl on the top of the mountain. Of course, we prayed for the city. We read the Bible. We both shared how we love Jesus. And both were infatuated. And I'm so glad that I did not allow that infatuation, that attraction to become my distraction. It would have destroyed my ministry. Yeah, five months later, I moved on. The girl moved on. And everything and I got married at the age of 24 and I can tell you one thing I am so glad I am so glad I did not wake up sexually at the age of 14 and for the rest of my 10 years chase one person throughout high school years and fight with these temptations I want to tell you something if your love feelings woke up for somebody and you know it's not your time to get married in the next three years and you have it your teenager can I please as your older brother as your pastor, can I beseech with you? I know the feelings are strong. I know they seem like they're from God and they, I'm not asking you to kill them. I'm asking you, ask the Lord to put them to sleep until it's the right time. Why? So you can wake up your ministry. You can change your school. Be actually close with your real friends. Not so jealousy and discord and division to the youth ministry. 
not fall into temptation and then find yourself pregnant and the guy moves on not end up heartbroken and then end up saying you know what I can't trust anybody again and then when the right time comes so you can do something that's celebrationary that everybody's involved in it instead of running around being sneaky are you, are you with me this is, I mean, I'm not just sharing with you today how to go let's go just shake it, bake it and everything. I'm just sharing with you something that when you go home, what to do with these feelings, what to do with, with you reading the Bible, what to do with your attraction is that don't allow it to be a distraction. There are some of you here today and you're dating somebody and honestly this Pastor Zach did not tell me to preach on this. And so I did not know anybody and this message is not directly to anybody but if I'm hitting you, if I'm hitting your address, Maybe Holy Spirit knew this and maybe He's speaking to you right now. Maybe you're here today and you secretly have a relationship and you know God doesn't approve it but you kind of like it and you're like man but I just I really really like it. Don't allow those things that you like to destroy the love, the life that you love. Can somebody say amen? amen. And I'm gonna wrap this up with the last thing and that is this. Don't believe lies. Prioritize your spiritual life. Take care of your spiritual life by reading the Bible and ministering. Don't allow attraction to become a distraction. And lastly, for Adam and Eve, you know, Adam went to sleep. God woke him up, brought him a wife. He was so happy. He was so good. They got married. Everything is good and, and lovely. Until the Bible says, a snake comes and this beautiful couple, it's enjoying ministry, enjoying service to God, enjoying each other. Everything is fine. And the devil tells them this. The devil says, has God really said? And you would think in the perfect world, why would you believe something? And God, the devil lied to them and they believed the lie. There was a preacher that was coming to our church one time and he was from Africa. A week or two before he came, somebody pretended to be him on Facebook, reached out to a lady in our church and said, God has given me a word. I'm coming to your church. He's pretending to be her. And this lady didn't check all the letters in the title and the username, thought it was him because she saw a few videos of him. And this fake person said, God told me about your family. He told me about two of your kids, which was not difficult to figure that out because she had it all over her Facebook feed. And something is about to happen to one of your kids. If you don't call me back, something bad will happen to one of the kids. So the lady panicked. She quickly uses a Facebook messenger, calls him. He puts a cloth over a microphone and speaks to her from a cloth and of course from a distance. So she will not be able to discern if it's his voice that she got used to listening on YouTube or not him. She's not tech savvy so she's not paying attention to the fact that it might not be him because he doesn't have any followers on Facebook. And the guy calls her and says this. She's, he begins to say, you've had a problem, ta -da 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 -da. you're struggling financially, you have doubts. Typical things that pretty much anybody can, can say can apply to anybody. And says this, one of your daughters is going to die unless you give me $10,000. You sow $10,000 into my ministry today. She said, she, my daughter's gonna die. She, yeah, she's like, there will be a tragic accident, but you can prevent it. God's angel showed and literally just BSing his way through. And the lady is just shaking, scared for her daughter. And then he says this He says, Do not tell your pastor and your husband. We should tell you a green, like a red light that it's, this is wrong. So she quickly hangs up the phone, runs to her husband and says, we need to withdraw $10,000 and wire this money quickly. And the husband is like, this is weird. He's like, we need to call Pastor Vlad. This is, if Pastor Vlad is inviting this prophet and this prophet is asking for the money, I mean, we should tell Pastor Vlad. No, this, this prophet said, he, we cannot tell him until we wire the money because if we tell him, then our daughter will die. So the husband is like, okay, let's do whatever we need to do. We don't want our daughter to die. They wire $10,000. An hour later, he gets hold of me and he said, hey, this prophet just asked me and I said, can you send me his, uh, his contact? So I called the guy, this prophet. He tried to tell me about my wife to send him 10,000. And I said, you little devil. I was like, you manipulative, lying spirit. I rebuke you in Jesus' name. And then of course he hung up and blocked me. The lady lost $10,000 to somebody that lied to her. After that she had a, such a difficult time with any preacher because it's very difficult because she got so duped and so lied. These are the lies the devil will tell you and I'm going to give you them. 
the first lie that he will tell you is your birth was an accident. God's word says, for I know the thoughts that I think of you. I have a plan, meaning your birth is not an accident. The second lie the devil will tell you is you are a victim. And this lie is going to be taught in your school through critical race theory, which simply says that United States has a systemic racism that exists at the very foundation of our country and continues to shape our lives today. And to this detriment, the black people, the Russian people, the Asian people, the Latin people, indigenous people and other people of color. And this systemic racism exists to benefit the white people. And you will be told this, that if you're black, you're oppressed. If you're white, you are an oppressor solely based on the color of your skin and your race will determine the outcome of life so if you are part of the minorities you are a victim automatically don't even try and i want to tell you something that is a lie from the pit of hell you're not a victim you're more than a conqueror <laughs> critical race theory is demonic was there racism in america 100 percent but as a christian we don't live under the system of this world and it doesn't matter what family you came from, it doesn't matter what race you are in, what doesn't matter what color you are, and it doesn't matter what your family did or who they are, you can rise above that, you can have a degree, you can have a good job, you can have a good reputation, you can have a great impact, you can be who God wants you to be in this generation, you are not a victim and you don't have to reflect the lie of the enemy. Can somebody say amen? amen. The third lie that the enemy will say is you were born in the wrong body. And this will be also pushed by the culture. You were born in the wrong body. Or you prefer to have the other gender. You seem to kind of be more masculine, but you're a young lady and you don't enjoy necessarily a lot of the feminine things. You know what? Most likely you are experiencing what they call gender dysphoria. Gender dysphoria is when a person feels conflicted with their identity as a female being in a female body. And gender dysphoria is a real problem that people can experience and they need counseling, they need help sometimes, they need just somebody to walk alongside with them. But the devil will come to you and say, this thing that you are feeling, I have a solution for you. Number one, puberty blockers. Number two, gender reassignment surgery. You are trapped in the wrong body. The culture shouldn't tell you that you're a male or a female. You can choose to be who you want to be and guess what begins to happen? You believe the lie and now you reject the fact that God created the male and female and now you're going in against God's order because you believe a lie. But if you study the studies of people, young people who got lied by the doctors, by the teachers and therapists and went and got healthy working body parts castrated, then they have regrets and nobody wants to put those bodies, body parts back and now they live their life and some of them even take their own life. Because the devil when he gives you a lie, it's to destroy your life. If you were born a male, it's because God has you as a gift to this generation. If you were born a female, God has you as a gift to this generation. Now if you reject God, yeah I understand you will have a difficult time accepting His gift and you will be confused because you are your own God. But that's why I want to tell you, you came from God, you need God and accept the truth that God wants you to wrap and enjoy the gift of your gender and allow your identity, your gender identity to be connected with your gender. Reject the lie of the culture. I know it's popular. I know this, what I'm sharing with you can get me canceled and banned. But what I'm telling you is this, the Bible teaches us He made the male and female. Gender is not something you decide. You don't wake up one day and say, well, I am, I identify today as a female when you're a male. Any more that I can identify as a president. Or I can identify, a cyclist can identify as a motorcycle. We can't do that. And so you might say, but I feel like it. You can feel all you want, but you submit your feelings to the truth and you don't allow that you, what you feel to become your fact. You base your fact on God's Word and reject the lie. The lie sounds sweet, the lie sounds convincing and the culture will feed it because the culture is not on the side of truth. Are you with me? The other lie that Satan will tell you is love is love. What does this mean? He will tell you this, what's wrong? If I sexually attracted, I am attracted to the same gender. What's wrong with that? Love is love, I'm not hurting anybody. For those of you who maybe have that idea and you believe that because of the culture, let me ask you a question. Water is water. Water in your toilet is contaminated. 
it's not drinkable. To say water is water and to drink with a straw from a toilet water is wrong. Same thing with love. God is love but love is not God. God decides and tells us out of His love that same-sex attractions, they are not His will for us. He created us to desire the opposite heterosexual. This is not cultural conditioning. This is not white man's religion. This is not suppression. This is God creating them, Adam and Eve, male and female. How do I know this is from God? If the same-sex attraction would have been from God, it would produce babies. It does not. That's why they're after our babies because they cannot have their own. And I want to tell you something, listen to me very carefully. I know that you're very young but the culture wants to indoctrinate you and I want to educate you through the scriptures. Love is not love. God is love and He tells us what is true and what is not. And we must not submit our desires and our lusts and our urges to the culture. We must submit it to God's Word. Because right now we have a man in, I think it was in Netherlands, who decided to marry his computer. He went to court and he says, I want to have a marriage certificate with me in my computer. Another person in California who wants to marry his horse. Because he claims he loves his horse and his horse and him supposed to be in a marital relationship. You look at this like, oh, nasty. But why is that nasty if a man can be in love with another man? Love is love. If love becomes your God, you will fall into perversion. You will fall into twisted, immoral things that do not honor God. Love is not love. God is love and He redefines real love for us. Can somebody say amen? amen? Number fifth lie and I just have two more. You are not what people say. You are not what you see in the mirror. You are not how much you weigh. You are not the labels people put on you. And the last lie is suicide is not a solution. Suicide is not a solution. It's a permanent decision. To a temporary problem. Suicide tells you there is hope in death. Jesus tells you there is hope in me. You don't find solution in your death. In fact, suicide is like this. It's like strapping a suicide vest in a mall full of children thinking it only hurts you. It hurts your family, it hurts your friends, and it hurts your closest siblings. The only solution is to lay your life to Jesus and say, Jesus, the pain I'm feeling is too hard for me. I can't take this anymore, but I believe you can help me and He will heal your heart and He will restore your life. Can somebody say amen? <laughs> Teenage years are what? To God. We are the salt of this earth. We are the salt to the source. Come on somebody, I like this. You guys are, you guys are picking up what I'm laying down. We are the salt to the source. The source is our school. The way we become the salt is we put God first in our life. We prioritize spiritual growth by reading the scriptures. We also recognize attractions are okay. But the moment they become distraction, this becomes a demonic activity to pull us away from the Lord. We put our eyes, close our eyes until the time is right. And we understand is that when we start doing spiritually well, culture will use lies, the devil will use lies, they will sound educated, they will sound convincing, they will sound appealing. And sometimes they'll resonate with our feelings, what we're feeling and it almost feels like it's validating what I'm feeling. Yeah, they understand. Finally, somebody understands. The church doesn't understand. My mom doesn't understand. But finally, this teacher understands. This therapist understands. This, this Hollywood, this TikToker understands. They came out of the closet and they feel so free and they feel so alive. Yeah, I feel exactly the same. I've always identified this way. I have somebody that understands. No, you're being lied to. It feels good at the moment, but you're being deceived. The devil is the father of lies. If it does not line up with God's scripture, listen, it's a lie and you will regret following it down the road. In the beginning it will feel sweet, but then it will have its bitter fruit. I want you to rise. I want to ask you, how many of you today are willing not to just make an emotional decision? This will mean a lot to give a tithe to God. 
So everybody put your hands down for just a second. And when you heard this message, and you know this is not going to be easy, this will require a lot of help from your leaders, from Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Because distraction is going to be there. Lies are going to be there. Um, laziness is going to hit there. But how many of you today, after listening to this, and you say, I want to bring a tithe to God. And my tithe is my teenage years. Jesus, I want to live them for you. I want to live them to know you. I want to live them to change my school. I want to live them to be unashamed of the gospel. I want to live them to be in love with Jesus. I want to live them to be in love with the truth. Even if nobody supports me, I will live by the truth. I will reject the lies that I'm trapped in the wrong body. I will reject the lies that love is love. I will reject the lies that I'm a victim. I will reject the lies of the culture and I will stand for the truth. I will prioritize my walk with God. Even when I feel these attractions, I'm not going to feed them because I'm going to focus on Jesus and I'm going to put them to sleep until it's the right time. I know it's not going to be easy. I know I'm going to miss some parties. I'm not, I know I'm going to be called with names, but it is what it is. I want to give my teenage years as a tithe to God. God, make me a soul to my school. Make me a soul to my source. Come on, raise those hands for those of you who are saying, I'm going to be a tithe to God. I want you to open up your mouth, close your eyes and begin to offer yourself up to God. Offer your body right now. Offer your soul. Tell Jesus, say, Jesus, I'm giving you my tithe. I'm giving you my teenage years. What's left of them? Five more years, three more years, four more years. Jesus, I'm laying my life as a living sacrifice. Not for girls, not for gold, not for fame, not for greed, but for God. Jesus you're my goal. I will pursue you. I will love my family. I will finish my school. I will prioritize my friends. I will be unashamed of Jesus. I will tell my friends about Jesus because the rest of my teenage years they don't belong to me. They belong to you. Jesus make me the salt of this world. Come on close your eyes. Open up your mouth. Begin to cry out to Jesus right now. Release a hunger cry. Release a prayer of surrender right now. Tell that to the Lord. Say, Lord I surrender my the rest of my teenage years to your purpose and to your mission to your vision and into your plan right now Jesus I love you Jesus burn inside of me with your spirit right now come on from the back to the front, from the left to the right, press into the Lord offer that to Him right now offer that life right now to Him we're not asking, we're not just saying to lay a bad habit, we're saying to lay the teenage years as a tie to the Lord so that we can be the salt to our source, salt to our schools. For those of you who desire to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you don't speak in tongues, put your hands down for just a second, you don't speak in tongues and today you would like to speak in tongues, you would like to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want you to raise your hand for those of you who desire that. Okay. Now I'm going to ask you to do something. Can you step in a little bit closer? Those of you who want to receive it, just step in closer. And those of you who speak in tongues, just take, take a step back. Take a step back. For those of you who want to receive the gift of tongues, you, you, you believe in Jesus. You want to, all the Holy Spirit has for you. And you want to receive the gift of tongues, just step in closer. Just step in closer. And the rest of you, just step it back. I'll invite you in just a moment to pray for... Uh -huh. Okay, I want you guys to look at me for just a second. For those of you who are in the front and you want to receive the gift of tongues, just look at me for a second. The Bible says that the Holy Spirit as in a Christian lives inside of us. And the Bible says out of a belly will flow the rivers of living water. So the Spirit of God is a person but He lives inside of you. And like a water, He wants to flow out through your mouth. Now the way that happens is this, when you yield to the Holy Spirit, which is not hard to do, you guys are younger, so it's when you get a little bit older, it gets harder. When you, when you yield to the Holy Spirit, the syllables, the sounds that come from right here, not from right here, you just release them through your mouth. We're going to pray right now and you will feel the Holy Spirit. When you feel the Holy Spirit, release those sounds by faith. They will not make sense here, which is okay. The devil will tell you on this side, he says, you're making this up. Actually, it's your sounds 
It's not something from the, there. The Bible says from the river that's inside of your belly. That's the Holy Spirit. Think of this. Your house has water connected to it. How do you drink water out of it? You turn the faucet on. The same way the Holy Spirit's tongues flow out when you open your mouth. When we're going to pray right now and if you keep your mouth closed, you won't speak in tongues. So you, you open your mouth and you release those sounds. You can say hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And then that switch begins to happen with those sounds that don't come from you. They may even sound like somebody else's tongues. It doesn't matter. Every sound makes sense to God. Every sound makes sense to God. None of the sounds are strange. They're strange to you. They're not strange to God. The other part that I wanted to mention is this. If you overthink it or if you are scared, because that's what, that's what was me. When I was uh, 13 and a half, I was so scared and, and I was overthinking. And I already, like the, the river, like that, that was just kind of filling up right here. And I would refuse to yield control because I was afraid of losing control. And you have to let go. You have to let, you have to become like childlike in the presence of Jesus. Something will happen. There's rivers who begin to gush out. You will speak in other tongues. You will not understand them at first, but then God will begin to give you that understanding. You will sing in other tongues. Some of you will happen so powerfully, you won't stop speaking in tongues for days. I remember, see, I saw this. When one kid got so filled with the Holy Ghost, he slept the whole night speaking in tongues. Sucks for his roommates because they couldn't sleep with him. Literally, non-stop, he couldn't stop. Now, for most of you, that's not going to happen. So do not worry. Some of you are like, man, I don't think I want this by now and stuff. So do not worry. It's precious. It's beautiful. Every author of the New Testament spoke in tongues. It's not just speaking in tongues. It's receiving power that comes from being filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen. I shared the story of my friend, my friend David Diga. My friend David Diga always shares, and I've shared this at Hungry Gen, and so I'm going to repeat it again. One father was teaching his daughter how to pray, and so he taught her the Lord's Prayer. And you know, she memorized the Lord's Prayer, and so the next day he says, I want you to pray by yourself, and I'm going to step away. And so he steps away, and of course he was eavesdropping on her, and he puts his ear to the room, and he hears her not praying the Lord's Prayer, but praying A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And she finishes the alphabet, and, and you know, he's pretty frustrated. Why is she doing ABCs? The next day, she does exactly the same thing. And the third day, he had it enough. He comes to her and he says, listen, I taught you the Lord's Prayer. Why are you doing ABCs? She says, Daddy, that's so simple. I give God the letters and I trust Him to arrange them like He likes it. You know what speaking in tongues is? As you release those sounds from the Spirit, your Spirit, where the Holy Spirit lives, God adds meaning to those sounds. At first they don't make sense to you but they make sense to God. And it takes surrender. Speaking in tongues is a great insult to your pride. Because you're speaking in language you don't understand. And a lot of people are like, man, that's just gibberish, that's just crazy. But the Bible says those who believe in Jesus will speak in other tongues. It edifies our spiritual men, glorifies God and it gives us Speaking in tongues is like a key to all other gifts in the Holy Spirit. Amen. I want you to stretch your hands like this. Those of you who come and you want to receive the gift of the speaking in tongues. You're going to release the Holy Spirit today through praying in tongues. Say this with me. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, I believe you are the Son of God who died on the cross for all my sin. I receive your gift of salvation and the Holy Spirit. I don't deserve more of you, but you want me to have it and I'm hungry for it. I can't live as a teenager without all of the Holy Spirit and I want more right now. Touch me Lord. Fill me by your Spirit right now from the top of my head to the soles of my feet. Baptize me with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And as I release the sound, the river, the syllables from my spirit, I trust you will begin to add meaning to them. In Jesus name. Come on, just close your eyes, lift up your hands, just begin to worship Him right now. Father, fill them with the Holy Ghost right now. And everybody else is speaking tongues. Fill them with the Holy Ghost. 
fire 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 of God right now fall on you right now in the name of Jesus be filled with the Holy Ghost be filled with the Holy Ghost that's it that's it that's it it's falling right now just release that fear not just release that just release those sounds fill them with the Holy Ghost right now and now the young leaders you can come and pray for them you can pray with them just pray in tongues the rest of your congregation, young people, just pray in the Holy Ghost right now. Just all over this room. Come on. Holy Ghost fire, Holy Ghost fire, come right now Lord, let your fire come right now Lord, let your Holy Ghost fire come right now. Come on, other leaders, just come around them right now and just pray with them. Just pray with them. Don't scream in their ears, but just pray with them in tongues and just release it. Just release it. The river is there. Some of you feel that fire already. You feel the river bubbling inside of your heart right now. And just fear not. Just let it go. Just let it go. Just surrender. Just surrender. That's all it is. is you gotta surrender. You are too young. You are too young to overthink it. You are too young to be afraid. You are too young to hold back. You are too young to have these complications in your mind. Just let it go. Let the Holy Spirit flow. Let the river flow. Let the fire fall. Let the anointing fall afresh right now. Receive the Holy Ghost fire. Receive the Holy Ghost fire. Receive the Holy Ghost fire. Lama Masi Vibara Lama. Lebedere Berere. Yalaba Dala Borololo. Aramana Lama Araba Dala Borololo. Aramana Lama Dala. and those of you that are standing there pray for somebody else right now those of you that are standing there and you're not in the front just pray for the student next to you pray that there will be the salt in their school pray that there will be the salt at the source pray right now that God will give them grace to overcome attractions to overcome lies to overcome demonic attacks Father in the name of Jesus I ask you that you will make us a salt at a source Come on, place your hand up on your heart right now and say, God, give me, make me a salt. Make me a salt, a salt in my school. Make me a salt to my generation. Make me a salt, God. As I give my body right now, as I give my life to you, Lord, make me a salt. Make me a salt. Make me a salt, God. May our generation be preserved. Make me a salt. Use me for your glory. Holy Ghost, fire on my life. Holy Ghost, anointing on my life. Holy Spirit presence on my life. Make me a salt to my generation. Make me a salt to my middle school. Make me a salt to my high school. Make me a salt to my family, Lord. Make me a salt to my family, Lord. Anoint my mouth. Anoint my heart. Anoint my life. 
Anoint me with your presence and with your spirit, Lord. Anoint me with your presence and your spirit, Lord, for your glory, for your glory. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody say, I will be a salt at the source of my school. Say, my teenage years are my tithe to the Lord. I will make a priority of my spiritual life. I will not allow demonic attraction to be my distraction. Say, I reject every lie of this culture, of this world that contradicts God's Word. In Jesus' name.